In the 1940s, when Union Pacific's big boy ruled American railroads as the heaviest, most powerful steam locomotive ever built, a rival company quietly designed an even greater behemoth, engineered to outmuscle the legend, yet doomed to rust in silence. This abandoned giant was poised to pull more weight, break more records, and redefine railroading, but it never turned a single mile. If the big boy was the king, why did its one true challenger vanish before the world ever saw what it could do? The answer reveals how the fate of a single locomotive became a warning for every company betting on yesterday's technology. Just as the race to be the biggest suddenly became a race against time. Union Pacific's big boy wasn't just a locomotive. It was a statement of intent. When the first of these giants rolled out of Alco's Schenectady Works in 1941, it weighed in at over 1.2 million pounds with its tender, stretching 132 feet from coupler to coupler. Each big boy carried a boiler pressure of 300 pounds per square inch, feeding 16 massive driving wheels arranged in a 4884 configuration. The result was a starting tractive effort of about 135,000 pounds, enough to muscle freight trains over the steepest grades of the Wasatch Mountains without the need for extra engines. Big Boy's job was simple, but daunting. Haul long, heavy trains up and over the Rockies, day after day, in all weather. It did just that throughout the 1940s and into the 1950s, becoming a legend not just for its size, but for its reliability and sheer capacity. Crews respected the big boy's power, and rail fans measured every other locomotive against its record. 25 were built, numbered 4,000 through 4,024, and they worked the Cheyenne to Ogden run for more than a decade before the arrival of diesel power began to push them aside. Even in retirement, Big Boy's reputation didn't fade. Several were preserved, and Union Pacific 4014, restored and running excursions today, remains a living symbol of what steam could achieve at its peak. For any railroad daring to challenge this titan, the bar was set impossibly high. Bigger, stronger, and more capable than anything that had come before, Big Boy became the yardstick by which all future giants would be measured. Any rival would have to do more than match the numbers on paper. It would have to rewrite the rules of what a locomotive could do. At the height of American steam innovation, the Pennsylvania Railroad refused to play second fiddle to any rival, especially not Union Pacific's Western Colossus. For decades, the Pennsylvania Railroad's reputation rested on more than just its sprawling network. It was a culture of relentless engineering ambition, fostered in the bustling halls of the Altoona Works. Here, the company's designers and machinists tackled every problem in-house, from casting massive beds to experimenting with cutting-edge drive systems. By the late 1930s, this spirit produced a string of headline-grabbing prototypes. There was the S1, a 6446 duplex so enormous it barely fit the tracks at the 1939 World's Fair. There was the T1, a sleek, high-speed 4444 built for passenger glory, and the Q2, a 4464 duplex freight engine that, on paper, could outpull nearly anything else on rails. The drive behind these projects was more than pride. It was a conviction that the next leap in locomotive power would come not from copying the articulated giants of the West, but from inventing something entirely new. The railroad's chief mechanical minds believed in the duplex philosophy, splitting the driving wheels into two sets under one rigid frame, aiming for higher speed and smoother operation than traditional articulateds. This approach promised to combine brute force with the grace required for the railroad's dense, curving eastern mainlines. Every new design was a chance to prove that Altoona's workshops could outthink and outbuild any competition, no matter how daunting the challenge. The records from this period show the company pouring resources into technical mastery, complex valve gear, high-pressure boilers, 
and advanced metallurgy became routine projects. For the Pennsylvania Railroad, building a locomotive to surpass Big Boy was not just a reaction, it was the logical outcome of a corporate identity built on always pushing further. The ambition was clear. If any railroad could redefine the limits of steam, it would be Pennsylvania. Using its unmatched shop capacity and a willingness to gamble on radical ideas. As the blueprints grew bolder, so did the conviction that the next true giant of American railroading would wear Tuscan red. The blueprints that haunted Altoona's drafting rooms were nothing short of audacious. Pennsylvania Railroad's engineering staff, emboldened by their success with the Q2 and S1, set out to draft a freight locomotive that would eclipse even the mighty big boy not just in size, but in every measurable category of performance. On paper, this was a machine that strained the limits of what rails, bridges, and even human crews could handle. The core of the design borrowed from Pennsylvania Railroad's duplex philosophy, but with a radical twist. Instead of a classic articulated layout or a simple rigid frame, engineers envisioned a hybrid two sets of driving wheels mounted under a single elongated cast bed, each powered by its own pair of high-pressure cylinders. The plan called for a wheel arrangement that blurred the line between articulated and duplex, something approximated as 44884 or even 44664 depending on which sketches survived the early drafts. The boiler itself was to be an engineering marvel targeting pressures well above 300 pounds per square inch, possibly reaching as high as 350 pounds per square inch, if the metallurgy could be trusted to hold. The firebox and grate area would dwarf anything previously attempted in the east, with a heating surface large enough to supply continuous punishing output on the longest grades. Tractive effort figures were calculated to break records, at least 150,000 pounds force at the drawbar if the numbers held up in practice. This was not a locomotive for the timid. The heating surface area, based on scaling up the Q2's already vast dimensions, could have topped 8,000 square feet, with a grate spanning over 150 square feet. Figures that rivaled or exceeded Big Boy's 132 square foot grate and 5,500 square foot heating surface. An advanced system of poppet or rotary cam valves was specified, aiming for both efficiency and the ability to maintain high speeds without valve float or loss of cylinder pressure. Every line on these blueprints radiated confidence. Some would say hubris that Altoona's shops could build a machine to outclass anything from Alco or Lima. The drawings also called for a tender of unprecedented size, capable of carrying enough coal and water for extended runs without refueling, and a frame cast in a single piece to absorb the immense mechanical stresses of starting and stopping such a behemoth. The cab was to be equipped with the latest in crew comforts and safety systems, including a modern stoker, advanced slip detection, and provisions for experimental roller bearings to reduce friction at every axle. The calculated weight, engine and tender combined, would have pushed well past 1.3 million pounds, exceeding even Big Boy's imposing mass. In theory, this composite giant could have hauled longer, heavier trains over the Alleghenies than anything before or since. The engineering team was convinced that with the right track and facilities, their design could pull 4,000 tons up a 1.14% grade at speed a direct answer to the feats that made Big Boy legendary in the West. Every technical detail, from the double-ended boiler stays to the oversized superheater units, was chosen to push the boundaries of steam technology as far as possible before the age of diesel. But these ambitions came at a price. The size and complexity of the design meant that every supporting system, from roundhouses to turntables to maintenance shops, would need to be scaled up or rebuilt entirely. The strain on infrastructure was not just a footnote, it was an existential question. Even as the blueprints grew more detailed, 
the practicalities of running such a locomotive on Pennsylvania Railroad's dense, curving network loomed ever larger. For a moment, though, the dream was alive, a machine that, at least on paper, could have rewritten the record books and humbled even the great big boy. By the late 1940s, the economics of American railroads were shifting beneath the feet of even the most tradition-bound executives. Diesel-electric locomotives, once dismissed as novelties, were now delivering results that could not be ignored. On the balance sheet, the numbers told a story of relentless efficiency. Operating costs for diesel units came in 30 to 40 percent lower than their steam rivals, an advantage that compounded with every mile of mainline track. Where a steam engine demanded a full crew, constant attention, and regular stops for water and coal, a diesel could run hundreds of miles with minimal servicing. The difference in maintenance cycles was even starker. Steam locomotives required frequent overhauls, often every few months, while a diesel prime mover could go a year or more between major shop visits. Maintenance demands were lower, and downtimes were shorter. Fuel costs also tipped the scales. Coal and water had to be sourced, hauled, and handled at every terminal for steam, while diesel fuel arrived by pipeline or truck and was pumped directly into tanks in minutes. The cost per ton mile for a diesel dropped steadily as technology improved, while steam numbers barely budged. For a railroad operations manager, the arithmetic was brutal. Even the most advanced steam locomotive could not compete with a fleet of modular, reliable diesels that could be linked together in multiple unit sets and controlled by a single engineer. Modularity meant flexibility. Add power for heavy trains, subtract it for lighter loads, all without tying up extra crews or idling massive engines between assignments. Modularity changed how railroads scheduled power. The speed of diesel adoption was nothing short of historic. In 1940, steam still reigned across America's main lines. By 1950, diesels had carved out a dominant share of new locomotive orders. By the mid-1950s, the last major steam purchases had ended, and yards across the country were filling with retired giants, some barely a decade old. Adoption was swift. The Pennsylvania Railroad, with its deep investment in steam-era infrastructure, faced a wrenching dilemma. Every roundhouse, water tower, and coaling station represented sunk costs. But the savings offered by diesels made clinging to the past a losing bet. For the men tasked with keeping trains moving and budgets in the black, the verdict was clear. A single diesel road unit could replace not just one, but sometimes two or three steam locomotives on the same run, all while slashing labor and fuel expenses. The old arguments, romance, tradition, even engineering pride carried little weight in the face of quarterly reports and shareholder demands. The numbers did not lie. Diesels offered higher reliability, lower downtime, and a path to profitability that no steam design, no matter how ambitious, could match. The dream of a new super steam giant built to outclass Big Boy was being quietly outmaneuvered by an army of boxy, soot-free machines that seemed to multiply overnight. In boardrooms and back offices, the question was no longer whether Diesel would win, but how soon the last coal-fired Titan would be pushed aside. The decision landed in a conference room, not on the shop floor. At the end of the 1940s, Pennsylvania Railroad's executive team gathered to weigh the future of the proposed super locomotive. The numbers on the table were stark. To run a machine of this scale would demand a roundhouse expansion, new turntables stretching beyond 130 feet, and bridges reinforced to handle axle loads never seen before on eastern rails. Every supporting facility, from ash pits to water towers, would need a costly overhaul. The capital needed just to turn the engine around at division points rivaled the price of a small town's annual budget. Sunk costs from decades of steam infrastructure, coal docks, water cranes, and maintenance shops were now liabilities, not assets. The board pored over cost projections that showed diesel units, already proven in mainline service, 
slashing operating expenses by one-third or more. The new giant, by contrast, would lock the railroad into years of additional spending, just to keep pace with the technology already on the way out. The debate was not just numbers. For the engineers and shop foremen at Altoona, the plans represented years of pride and innovation. Some had staked reputations on the project, believing it would carry Pennsylvania Railroad's name into a new era of steam supremacy. But the mood in the boardroom was grim. One executive reading aloud the bridge rating reports noted that even if the locomotive could be built, it might never run a full division without extensive and expensive track upgrades. Another pointed out the growing backlog of deferred maintenance on existing lines arguing that every dollar spent on the new engine was a dollar not spent keeping the rest of the network reliable. When the final vote was called, the answer was clear. The project was halted. No steel would be cut, no builder's plate stamped, no road number assigned. In the shops, word filtered down with a sense of disbelief and resignation. Ambition, once measured in tons and horsepower, was now measured in balance sheets and risk. The era of the steam giant ended not with a dramatic failure, but with a quiet decision behind closed doors. It left only blueprints and what-ifs in its wake. No locomotive ever rolled out of Altoona to claim the title of Big Boy's successor. The grand design, years in the making, engineered by some of the sharpest minds in American railroading, never left the drawing board. Its fate was sealed not by accident or disaster, but by a quiet consensus in the executive suite. As diesel power took hold, the blueprints were filed away, the cost estimates shelved, and the dream quietly abandoned. There was no unfinished hulk rusting in a siding, no last-minute plea for preservation. Instead, the only trace left behind was a stack of technical drawings and a few lines in the minutes of a board meeting, buried beneath decades of paperwork. Engineers who had poured themselves into the project found closure in numbers, not nostalgia. Some reflected that even if the locomotive had been built, its edge over Big Boy would have been modest, perhaps 10 to 20% more tractive effort, and maybe a few hundred extra tons up the grade. But the window for such a machine was already closing. At best, it might have seen five to 10 years of service before the relentless advance of diesel locomotives consigned it to obsolescence. There would have been no time to build a legend. Only a brief, expensive experiment. In the end, the real loss was not a missing engine, but a missed opportunity to adapt. The story echoes far beyond railroads. The fate of the abandoned giant mirrors Concorde's final landing. The last Airbus A380 rolling off the line Kodak's fading grip on film, and Nokia's tumble from the top of the mobile world. Each was a marvel of engineering, the best of its kind, yet each found itself outpaced by a shift in technology or market demand. The lesson is as clear as it is sobering. Even the most powerful machine, the most ambitious design, can become a footnote if it arrives after the world has moved on. For the Pennsylvania Railroad, and for, and for every engineer who ever dreamed too late, the abandoned giant stands as a silent warning. Greatness without timing is just another story left unfinished. Right now, entire industries still gamble on scaling up old models, hoping size will outpace change. But history shows that innovation's timing, not just ambition, decides what endures. The real giants are rarely the biggest. They are the ones who see the turning point before it arrives. In a world racing toward its next transformation, that lesson has never been more urgent. What do you think? Are we repeating old mistakes?